Welcome to this session on Navier-Stokes equation as part of the NPTEL MOOC on transport phenomena in materials. In this session, we are going to derive the Navier-Stokes equation uh, starting from the Newton's second law of uh, conservation of linear momentum. Okay. So, this uh, session may look a little tedious, however, uh, I advise that you pause at uh, appropriate locations, uh, do some of the algebra yourself and then get back because uh, it could be uh, quite uh, tedious if you are not familiar with the subscript notation, the tensor operations and the material derivative concept etcetera. So, all the things that we have done till now uh, will all be converging into this particular derivation. So, do pay attention what is coming at what stage, go back and refresh those concepts if necessary. So, the concept map for the derivation of Navier-Stokes equation is uh, given here. The starting point for the Navier-Stokes equation is nothing but the Newton's second law, the conservation of linear momentum and we see that it basically is talking about the velocities and uh, accelerations and how they are related to the forces. Now, uh, the difference between how we did that in high school and how we are going to do it in Navier-Stokes equation is that we are going to apply this to a control volume. And the moment we say that then we write expressions as integrations because we do not want to be constrained by the shape of the entire body. So, we are going to write integrals over the control volumes. And uh, we also will be borrowing the concept of uh, Reynolds transport theorem because at some point the rate of change will be then expressed in Eulerian specification. So, we have the need for the d by dt to go inside the integral. So, we use the Reynolds transport theorem there. And we will have quantities which are specified with the dot products with the surface uh, vectors and uh, then we can convert them to volume integrals using the divergence theorem. And uh, the flow is basically governed by forces and we see the forces as two different types. So, we see forces as fields which will be then coming as the body force and we can also see the forces applied on surfaces which are basically stresses and we see why the stress tensor can be called as a symmetric tensor. We will see a very briefly one discussion to convince you on that. And then we are going to decompose the symmetric stress tensor into two components, the pressure component, the way we know the pressure and the deviatoric stress component. And then we are going to relate the deviatoric stress to the velocity gradients through a linear constitutive equation introducing the concept of a Newtonian fluid. And then we put this all into the derivation along with the uh, tensor concepts like uh, a symmetric tensor when it multiplied with an asymmetric tensor and then summate then you get a 0 and uh, uh, how the uh, uh, isotropic tensor of order 4 can be uh, written and so on. So, all these things put together will give you the Navier-Stokes equation. So, you can see that in this concept map each of these concepts can be studied separately and be convinced about before we start this uh, derivation make sure that you are familiar with all these background concepts. And uh, the basic point that we must never forget is that we it is no different from the Newton's second law because that is the starting point for us. So, there is no more physics than what is there in the Newton's second law that is going into the Navier-Stokes equation. Okay, so, we start off by looking at uh, these terms here, we saw that the forces are necessary and so we are going to describe them. So, there are two types of forces that we are going to consider, the long range forces or the body forces or volume forces, these are the ones which decrease slowly with the distance between the interacting elements which means that fields that are like gravity. Of course, gravity is a function of distance, but for the kind of distances we talk about in fluid flow, then they are not very large typically about few centimeters or maybe even meters. So, therefore, we can assume that the gravity field does not change from one part of the domain to another part. So, such things are basically the volumetric forces we are talking about. So, most of the time we are only going to look at the gravity, but uh, there are situations where the electromagnetic flow can also be described and therefore, those also can be uh, brought into this. Sometimes we also have fictitious forces that will be coming in, fictitious as in they do not have a separate physics that is causing them, but they are coming because we have chosen a different coordinate system like for example, centrifugal or Coriolis forces. So, those also can be brought in as volumetric uh, forces uh, like this. So, anything that is volumetric should be then described in this manner. Okay, so, that you have the uh, rho dv coming as mass. So, f is basically the specific force. Okay, so, this basically f is this specific force which is basically force over mass. Okay. So, you know that the gravitational force is uh, m g and if you divide with m only g is remaining and therefore, one example for a specific force is just g. Okay. So, it will have the units of acceleration and uh, normally we think of y axis going upwards. So, if you want to write in a vectorial fashion, you can write it like this, okay. f is equal to g into the y vector, okay. in this case it is x 2. Okay. Now, uh, 
the forces the second type of forces that we are going to use are basically short range forces that is forces that are actually felt only on the surface and not beyond. Okay, so, for example, the stresses what we normally talk about are all surface forces because the stress is applied on the surface and then it is going to act on the body and it is the force is not actually penetrating into the bulk of the uh, body. Okay, so, these uh, stresses are basically both normal and shear together and therefore, we all sum it up and then say that it is a stress. Now, there are also other uh, things that uh, will come in. So, Marangani forces for example, due to surface tension gradients. Uh, these are also uh, basically stresses that are acting only on the surface and they can also be clubbed up along with uh, stresses like this. So, we have a very generic way of describing them sigma. Okay. So, it is a tensor of order 2 sigma into the area is then the force that we are talking about. So, the force is two types one is a body force like the mg and the other one is the uh, forces because of stresses that is basically sigma into the area. Okay. So, we have got those. Hmm. Now, uh, we now look at uh, what is it that we are going to uh, change. The momentum is changing because forces are acting on it. This is the summary of the Newton's second law. Now, we want to write the momentum uh, as an integral. So, what you are doing is like this. Okay. So, we see here uh, rho dv is basically the mass and then you multiply with the velocity and you have got the momentum. Okay. So, which means that this quantity what you have written is nothing but the rate of change of momentum okay, because the momentum alone is in this integral and then d by dt is giving you the rate of change in the Eulerian specification. So, the statement is basically the rate of change of momentum is caused by the forces. So, now is where the utility of the Reynolds transport theorem is coming in. So, we could see that the rate of change of momentum when you write like this and you can then take the d by dt in okay, like this we can by using the Reynolds transport theorem and then you now have rate of change of momentum written in a slightly different fashion where the acceleration term is coming inside the integral. Okay, acceleration as defined in the Eulerian specification. So, the, this is basically now going to be useful because we see that it is over an integral and as long as every other term is over the same integration of uh, over the dv, then we can take the integrands. So, that is the strategy why we want these d by dt's to go inside the integral. Okay. So, we have here the equation of motion. So, the equation of motion can be written in English like this the rate of change of momentum is equal to the total force that is acting on that fluid element or body whichever body is undergoing that change of momentum. So, in our case we are taking the control volume. So, the rate of change of the momentum of the control volume is equal to the total force that is acting. And we have already written the forces in uh, two ways. So, we have seen that here. So, we have written as two terms the volumetric force the F i rho d v and the surface forces which is a sigma ij nj ds. Okay. So, we have got those two terms. Now, we see that the second term we can write it in a slightly different manner we can use the divergence theorem. We already saw that the divergence theorem when we derived the continuity equation we saw it for a vector quantity, but at that time we also mentioned that you could generalize it. So, we are generalizing it in this fashion. So, uh, here is the generalized divergence theorem where the index that is matching is what is used for derivation here. So, which is nothing but basically um, the uh, stress dot n j is basically del dot uh, sigma. Okay. Now, we do not want to use those uh, quantities like del dot because it is already implied by the matching of subscripts. So, if you are already familiar with subscript notation you already see that on the right hand side j is matching and therefore, it must be a dot product over that particular index. Okay. So, now you introduce uh, this quantity inside here so, that the total force is now described in this manner. Okay. So, you could see that the uh, left hand side is the rate of change of momentum. Okay. So, rate of change of momentum is this fellow and the total force is on the right hand side. Okay, that is the total force. Okay. Now, you can see that this equation is written over the same control volume everywhere, so which means that the integrands also should be the same and that is exactly what we are doing. So, we have written that uh, the equation of motion uh, can now be written without the integrations, which means that this is now valid at every location in the domain. Okay. So, whichever domain you choose at every location this particular part is true. Now, this is not going to be very useful. Okay. Equation of motion looks good, it is very brief and it conveys the kind of sense that we know from the Newton's second law, but it is not useful in the sense uh, on the right hand side we have got sigma which we just do not know what to do with uh, because we are actually writing uh, this equation to determine uh, u. So, we want to 
uh, find out u and therefore, everything on the right hand side should be something that we know, but the sigma is something that we do not know. So, we need to do something about it and we are going to do that. Okay. So, what you are going to do is the sigma is basically stress tensor and if you expand it uh, because it is a tensor of order 2, you will have it as 9 components. So, you can see here 9 components here uh, because i j both indices go from 1 to 3, so you have got 9 components. So, I have intentionally written sigma 1 to here and sigma 2 1 here because this is the most general form. Now, we can say that how do I reduce these 9 components, I do not want 9 unknowns on the right hand side. So, I want to reduce the number of components. So, the way to do it is to see step by step. First step is a E is the sigma a symmetric tensor. Okay. If it is symmetric then we know that the 9 will become 6. Okay. So, you have less number of unknowns and then if it is so then uh, we want to then take out some quantity and we already know that the stress and pressure are having similar connotation in, uh, in, in plain English. We say that something is pressurized or something is stressed we mean the same thing. So, how do we bring out those kind of quantities and the sense of what we mean by pressure as in that is something to compress a particular body is then preserved. So, we will do that and in the process what we are trying to do is uh, on the right hand side wherever sigma is we want to change it to something that we know or can relate to in the uh, real life. Okay. So, here I want to uh, argue that uh, uh, stress tensor is a symmetric tensor. Okay. So, you could just simply state that uh, uh, stress is defined for continuum and therefore, it must be a symmetric tensor, but you can see why. Okay. So, let us take a control volume that is uh, drawn here. So, the control volume is drawn here in this manner okay. and at this point we uh, inspect uh, how the uh, forces are going to act if they are going to be caused by the stresses and we have uh, written sigma 2 1 and sigma 1 2, they could also be called as tau 2 1 and tau 1 2 or tau x y tau y z y x etcetera. So, uh, it is up to us which symbols we use. Now, the torque which is then acting at, at this point is uh, uh, governed by basically the force uh, imbalance uh, which is rotating uh, uh, this uh, control volume about the control clockwise direction as well as the clockwise direction. So, uh, each of these uh, forces are then uh, going to be summed up and we see that the area element multiplied by the distance you see that the torque is basically the difference in the stresses sigma 1 2 and sigma 2 1. So, if there is actually an imbalance between the two components sigma 1 2 and sigma 2 1, it means that on the control volume there is a torque that is acting. Now, what is the consequence if the torque is acting? So, the torque is acting then you can relate it to the angular rotation in this particular manner okay, and you could look up one of these you know strength of materials books to write this for a rigid body and blindly apply it for a control volume though it is not a rigid body, but then inspect what happens if you did that. If you did that what happens is that as when you cancel these uh, three volume elements you see that you have a problem here. What happens is that if you choose a smaller and smaller control volume if d x 1 and d x 2 uh, tend to 0 and if the sigma 1 to minus sigma 2, minus 2 1 is finite then what happens is that this will tend to infinity. Okay. So, now that is a problem because if you have any difference between the uh, two off diagonal terms of the stress tensor it will lead to uh, a very large or tending towards infinity uh, rotation of this control volume about the z axis which is not allowed because of continuum assumption. By that what we mean is this control volume is stuck to other control volumes around it. Okay. So, we are defined domain like this. Okay. So, if this is a control volume of our interest then it is stuck to all the control volumes around it and therefore, it cannot rotate by itself and definitely not at you know such uh, angular rotation speeds and therefore, it means that the only way to avoid this kind of an absurd situation is to say that this must be 0 which means that sigma 1 2 is equal to sigma 2 1. In other words the sigma uh, is a symmetric tensor. So, let us then assume that it is true and then go ahead and use that concept. So, we say that uh, if sigma is a symmetric tensor, we now have written here sigma 1 2, sigma 1 3 both ways and sigma 2 3 both ways which means that we now have uh, 6 components that are to be determined. Okay. So, from 9 we have got 6, so there is some progress. Okay. Now, let us go further and see what can we do about this. Now, here is where we see uh, the sense of uh, sigma and sense of pressure. So, let us consider sigma 1 1. Okay. So, what does sigma 1 1 mean? Which means that if you take uh, x 1, y x x 2 direction which means that the force acting on a plane x 1 in the 1 direction which means that uh, 
okay, on this plane, on this plane, okay, force acting in this same x direction, which means that it is basically the opposite of pressure because pressure is trying to compress this body. Okay, so we understand pressure in this manner, okay, and sigma 1 1 is basically trying to expand it in the x 1 direction. So, there is a uh, mix up of these two concepts, so we want to then separate them out. So, that is exactly what we are going to attempt. So, what we are going to do is that uh, the symmetric tensor e sigma is going to be written in two parts. The first part is basically what is going to be isotropic in nature okay. or you could also call it as uh, hydrostatic if uh, the fluid that is in question is water, otherwise you just simply call it as a static component and that gives a sense of pressure and the rest of it. Okay. So, we want to give them names and we can call the first one as uh, related to pressure and the second one as related to something that will make the control volume distort and therefore, we would like to call it as a deviatoric stress. Okay. Now, you could see that the quantity that I have used is sigma k k which is nothing but the trace of the uh, stress tensor. Now, the reason why we used stress is also for another uh, purpose. Uh, trace does not change with the coordinate system rotations, so it is a scalar. So, therefore, when you use these expressions, the expressions become valid in uh, any coordinate system. Okay. So, therefore, we put that here. So, 1 by 3 is done so that the first part has a trace of exactly sigma k k and the right second part will have a 0 trace because when you do the summation, you see sigma 1 1 plus sigma 2 2 plus sigma 3 3 minus of these. So, you get them cancelled out and, and, and you see that it should uh, you know not have any um, uh, trace. So, you now see that uh, you could uh, do the decomposition uh, in a subscript notation form like this. Okay. So, what was written in matrix form is now written as a subscript notation because you can see the first part is nothing but when you take the sigma k k by 3 out it is 1 0 0 0 1 0 0 0 1 and that is nothing but the Kronecker delta here that is written here. So, you just put it in there. Okay, so, we have now decomposed the stress tensor um, into two parts, one part which has the hydrostatic or isotropic component acting in all directions equally, equally because you could see that all the three uh, components are equal. So, equal stress acting in all directions that is the first component, second part is whichever is having the shear stress and other components that are there. Now, D i j will also have nine elements, but still we will have some way to relate it with what we know. Okay. So, once we have done this uh, separation, we can then now formally define. So, we are now here formally defining pressure. Okay. So, notice that uh, we have got the e triple equal which means we define the quantity P. So, we say that the pressure is what is defined as a minus of one third of the trace of the stress. Okay. So, it is basically the uh, uh, isotropic component of the stress tensor with a minus sign in front. Why is minus sign? Because pressure is always thought as something that compresses whereas, sigma 1 1 is going in the opposite direction. So, therefore, to make the same meaning come we just put a minus sign there. So, therefore, we can now write the uh, stress tensor as minus p delta i j plus d i j where delta i j is a Kronecker delta. So, we have effectively uh, separated the stress into pressure term and the deviatoric stress term. So, deviatoric stress is this fellow. Okay, so, this fellow is a deviatoric fellow and pressure term is this fellow. Okay, you can see that the stress is now composed of two components. This is going to be useful for us in a moment. Okay. Now, uh, there is some property of the deviatoric stress. You could see that the trace is 0. So, you could sum up the diagonal terms and you get a 0. Now, this is going to be very, very useful because later on when we are doing some derivation, we can actually see that this can be put to use. Now, uh, when dij is specified in any manner and you are asking what is dkk, what you are actually doing is repeating the subscript. So, from here to here you are going basically through a process in tensors that is called as contraction. Okay, so, you have an arbitrary tensor a i j k l and if you were to ask what would be a i i k l, then the, the contraction theorem says that it is also a tensor, okay, but order Okay, because only two subscripts are free, this is a tensor of order 4. So, you can actually have tensors of order n minus 2 obtained and they will also be tensors. So, here we see the same thing that is being used and therefore, we just simply uh, change the subscript and then go ahead and see what happens and uh, those expressions are also valid. Okay, so, we let us make those these kind of a things uh, useful and note down and then keep them aside. Okay. So, what happens uh, when a, a fluid is undergoing uh, 
uh, any uh, motion is as follows. So, so, if we have a fluid element which is described by A P C D, okay, then we see that in general it will undergo any arbitrary kind of a transformation. So, A B C D okay, is going to P Q R S. Okay, so, the transformation can be any arbitrary shape. Uh, we do not have uh, uh, things like this, you know, you do not have a control volume like that going and becoming like that. Okay, so, we do not want that because that is not a well behaved uh, fluid flow. Okay, so, you have things like this, you know, you could just have them stretched around okay, or just simply moved around or located. So, it's, it should be only things that are actually going to be a simple operations. Okay. So, such operations can then be decomposed into four different manners. One is the translation, just a relocation. Okay. So, we have got translation as the relocation of the control volume. After that rotation, pure rotation and then a pure shear and then pure dilation. So, one can prove that such arbitrary shape changes uh, can be described as a, a mix of all these four ways of changing the control volume. And now, you can see that these are also coming as a consequence of the velocity field. So, the velocity field which is a function of the uh, distance uh, will give you this. The reason is very simple. For constant velocities, it should have a translation of the control volume. In the case of velocities that are having gradients, it should lead to dilation. We have seen that in just a moment. But you see that shortly, for off diagonal terms, you see that the average of them will give you the shear and the difference of them will give you the rotation. So, you could see that these kind of transformations are coming mainly because of the velocity gradients. So, let us just look at what are those. So, what we do is basically A, B, C, D the locations we write the uh, coordinates x naught, y naught and the velocities as u and v. And in general there are these uh, gradients that are present. So, u has the gradient in both uh, you know x direction as well as in y direction. Okay. So, let us see how the velocities are specified. So, at A, B, C, D the locations are specified as x naught, y naught, x naught plus delta x, y naught and so on. So, which means that uh, the width is uh, delta x here and delta y here and A is basically x naught, y naught and you can see that B is nothing but x naught plus delta x comma y naught, D is x naught comma y naught plus delta y and C is x naught plus delta x comma y naught plus delta x. So, that is exactly what we have written. Okay, similarly, the velocities also can be done and by using the first uh, first order approximation uh, using Taylor's expansion, you can actually see that the velocity uh, at any location. For example, the velocity at B uh, is nothing but the velocity at A uh, plus the gradient okay, into that particular distance. Okay. So, that is what we are going to use and write the velocities. Now, once you have these velocities and positions, what we are going to do is how the position P Q R S is coming from A B C D due to the velocity times the uh, delta t. So, which means that uh, position of d t is nothing but initial position plus velocity times d t. Okay. So, once we do that, we could say that the position P, okay, so x P is nothing but x A plus u at uh, A position uh, times uh, uh, d t. Okay. So, this is how we can arrive at all the positions, new positions and we have written them. Now, once we write these positions, the advantage is basically we now have a way to define the different uh, components of uh, uh, these uh, dilations and shear and rotation. So, we now know the dilation. The amount of dilation is nothing but uh, dis uh, difference in the length divided by the original length and that will be the uh, amount of strain. Okay. So, such quantities are now going to be defined. Okay. So, we are going to define the dilational strain as follows P Q x minus A B by A B, which means that okay, if you see this P Q and x component, we drop a line, this is P Q x, this part is P Q x component. This divided by A B, okay. so P Q x minus A B divided by A B it shows you how much of expansion or contraction is happening along the x direction. So, it gives you this kind of a strain. Okay. So, dilational strain okay. and that is actually defined as S11. Okay. So, S11 is nothing but PQX minus AB by AB. Now, we have the values for the locations PQ as well as AB. So, we substitute them. Okay. PQ means basically the position uh, Q minus position P. Okay, so, we do that and when we do that, we get this very simple expression that the dilation is uh, given in this manner. 
rate of dilation okay so that is the rate of dilation okay because 1 by dt is already there okay so you could see that the velocity gradient in the x direction is giving the dilational rate in that direction which is already familiar to us similarly we can also do it for y direction and you see that the dilational strain okay, rate of deformation along the y direction is given by dv by dy so similarly we can also define the shear stresses so shear is basically defined in this following manner okay so what you do is that how much of this divided by how much of this okay that is the shear okay so what we do is we define the same way so the shear strain is redefined in this manner pqy by ab and then if you then locate the locations and derive you can see that the shear strain rate is given by this you can see the cross terms v and x of in two different directions are coming together so, so shear strain is coming like that and then the pure shear strain is written as an average of those two angles and then you see that this is how it is coming up okay and similarly the rotation also can be written the difference of those angles that gives you the rotation so you could see that uh, this quantity okay is a very generic quantity it's a strain rate tensor and it has basically the diagonal terms of diagonal terms and they seem to have uh, some meaning okay so we see that these terms okay the diagonal terms alone are related to the dilation the sum of the off diagonal terms are related to the shear the difference of the off diagonal terms is related to the rotation and the velocities themselves in absolute way are related to the translation which we are not bothered at this moment because we are only looking at the differentiations okay so now we see that we can actually write the uh, the generic quantity okay dou ui by dou xj as a sum of uh, symmetric and anti symmetric components stresses and those are actually what we are trying to do. so here the symmetric part we say it is eij and the anti symmetric is uh, omega ij and we see that the anti symmetric part is related to the rotation and the symmetric part is related to the dilation and shear okay so this is how the uh, strain rate tensor is going to be uh, decomposed so once you do um, then we also can see how the rotation part can be related to something else so we see that the rotation part can be related to the vorticity which we introduced as part of the planar flows uh, session so you could see that the vorticity is related to the om omega in this manner okay and uh, because you have got only three different components in omega because they are uh, anti-symmetric tensor and those three can be the components of uh, uh, the small omega capital omega and small omega related so they can be also called as the duals okay so which we see that it is an as anti-symmetric component of the uh, strain rate uh, uh, tensor okay and the reason why we want to do it is also because whenever it comes in summation then we know that symmetric and anti-symmetric tensor coming in summation will give you to 0 so that is why we are actually separating the uh, strain rate tensor into two components okay so let us do that now uh, the what is the linear uh, relationship that we want to derive the idea is as follows the shear stresses are going to cause deformations of a control volume in this manner okay so the shear stresses tau that is applied over will going to leave this this actually this kind of a change of control volume is described by the velocity gradients okay so which means that you could relate the shear stresses with velocity gradients and because shear stress is a tensor of order 2 and this also is a tensor of order 2 then the relation should be through a uh, linear um, a relationship with the property having a uh, most generic um, tensor order which is 4 2 plus 2 so that is exactly what we are writing here so here is a proposal okay so we are we are proposing that the cause which is basically the shear stress is leading to an effect which is basically the velocity gradients okay so we are proposing that they are related linearly so they may not be related linearly in some situations but let us hope that this uh, fellow is going to be helpful to us so now you can see that on the right hand side we have got sigma we separate into the pressure and dij and we then change the dij to the velocity gradients and then now you see that the velocities are appearing on the right hand side which is good because there is an unknown and then we can always handle that in some way okay so here is where the neumann uh, uh, neumann principle is going to be of uh, use so a is basically property okay you see that if uh, this is a cause and this is the effect and what is related to them both is must be a property 
okay. And uh, as according to Neumann principle, any property should have the same symmetry as that of the material for which we are describing that property. And what is the material here? It is a fluid. Now, fluids are isotropic. So, which means that the tensor that should be used to describe A must be a fourth order tensor which is an isotropic tensor which we have already come across in the introduction to tensors. The most generic way of uh, writing is uh, in this manner where there are actually three uh, independent quantities okay, which are basically mu 1, mu 2, mu 3. So, if you take a very generic uh, tensor A i j k L which is a fourth order tensor you must have 81 components. But in this case the A j k L is a property related to liquid which is isotropic. So, we can say that this kind of a expression can be used which means there are only 3 independent quantities. So, what we do is that we then uh, put it in and then see what happens. Okay. So, you see that on the left hand side the equation. So, you see that the left hand side equation d i j. Now, d i j is having symmetry over the indices i and j. The reason because sigma is actually a symmetric tensor therefore, the deviatoric stress also should be a symmetric tensor. On the right hand side the i j indices are appearing only for a which means that when you swap the indices on the left hand side then if this equation is valid they should also not have any effect on the right hand side. So, when I swap the indices on the left hand side nothing happens because d is a symmetric tensor. So, therefore, when I swap the indices on the right hand side also the same thing should be prevailing which means that uh, if you if you take the swap the indices for this quantity and uh, change i to j and j to i then uh, the quantity should not change and that is only possible when mu 2 is equal to mu 3 because you see these two quantities. Okay. So, I want to have okay, so mu 2 uh, delta i l delta k j plus mu 3 delta i k delta j l this is uh, before swap okay. and after swapping the indices i and j we see that it is j l and k i plus mu 3 j k and i l. Now, you see that these two are same actually delta j k k j because delta is actually a symmetric tensor it is Kronecker delta is a symmetric tensor. So, these two are same and these two are same which means that this and this must be the same. Okay. So, that is exactly what we are written here. So, saying that we actually do not need 3 independent quantities for the property A just 2 is enough. Okay. So, that is how we have reduced. So, now that we have said mu 2 is equal to mu 3 let us choose that value to be mu 2 itself and then write it as A i j k l is equal to mu 1 into delta i j delta k l plus mu 2 into delta i l delta k j plus delta i k delta j l. So, now we have got uh, a little less number of unknowns here. Okay. So, now once you look up this expression it appears as if even if you swap the indices uh, k and l nothing will change. So, this is an outcome of uh, the uh, expression that we have written. So, look at this expression and I will just uh, swap the indices k and l. Okay. So, a i j k and l I am swapping okay. and on the right hand side what is coming mu 1 delta i j delta k l. So, I write l k plus mu 2 delta i k delta l j plus delta i l delta j k. Now, you see that this expression and this expression are actually one and the same it is just that the terms are actually swapped. Okay. So, i k j l is coming second here it is coming first here and i l k j is coming first here it is coming second here. Okay. So, the constants are same and this and this are also same because delta Kronecker delta is also symmetric over the indices k and l which means that the right hand side does not change when you swap the indices k and l so, which means the left hand side also should not change which means that a is also symmetrical in the indices k and l. Okay. So, we now, now discovered that imposing the symmetry of the uh, deviatoric stress we are actually obtaining the properties of the uh, prop a which is basically saying that it is a symmetric over i j as well as k l. So, now you are writing the uh, expression once again and uh, the uh, expression we have written the con linear constitutive relation we actually wrote a linear constitutive, constitutive equation as follows. And we are uh, writing uh, this part as 2 because we can actually separate the uh, 
uh, velocity gradient as a symmetric and uh, anti symmetric parts we are writing there. Now, we expand A and we write here. So, we write here this part is nothing but the expansion of A. So, when you do this now what happens is that you could see sim immediately that uh, there is a symmetry of uh, k and l indices for the first term and you are dum doing a summation over uh, capital omega k l and capital omega actually anti symmetric over the same indices k and l. So, when you sum up that uh, term will be gone and therefore, we can just drop this term off. Okay. So, that is why you see here I do not have uh, capital omega k l because the summation will not survive. Okay. So, which means that we can now use this x epsilon k l and then multiply with everything and then see what happens. Okay. So, when we are doing that we could see that the part by part we can multiply. So, mu 1 delta i j k l into e k 1 k l. So, it is coming here and then we multiply. So, we are doing part by part. So, why are we doing part by part? Because the Kronecker delta has a specific property it can use it can be used to swap the indices and we are going to do that now. Okay. Okay, so, we are going to use the swapping of indices. Now, the E k l itself we already know the definition. Okay, so, that is nothing but the uh, definition showing that the, uh, the E is basically the symmetric part and uh, we can also see that D i j has the summation uh, 0 here for trace. The trace of D i j is 0 because we already removed the uh, diagonal elements from it while defining the pressure and that we can uh, now uh, use by seeing what happens if you do a contraction operation. So, what we do here is that i j you just do a, contra a contraction operation write d k k. So, instead of i j you just put k k and then see what happens. Okay. So, d k k the first one is like this d k k and then uh, this term okay, sig delta k k which means the summation over the 3 diagonal elements of a Kronecker delta that gives you 3. Okay and the remaining ones also going to be there. Okay. So, that is how we actually expand and then we see that we write in this manner okay. and you get a 3 there okay. and here the same term is coming. So, there must be 2 here. So, which means that uh, we see that as consequence of the trace of the deviatoric stress being 0, we get an equation like this. Now, this equation is very interesting because this gives us a relationship between mu 1 and mu 2. So, in other words, we do not actually need two independent constants, we actually get only one of them. Of course, in the case of incompressible fluids, the mu 1 and mu 2 can be different and this equation still be valid because actually the delta is 0. But if you want this equation to be valid even for not incompressible fluids, then uh, it is better that uh, this part is alone going to 0, which means that mu 1 and mu 2 are related. And this has a name, this is called the Stokes assumption. Okay. So, Stokes assumption we say that if you want this equation uh, to be 0 uh, even when the you know, rate of dilation delta is not 0, then it can only happen when the quantity in the parenthesis namely this quantity, this, this quantity uh, in the parenthesis uh, should not survive and uh, which means that we can actually relate mu 1 and mu 2. So, this is how we are relating mu 1 and mu 2 and this goes by the Stokes assumption which is valid for fluids that are contain, containing uh, uh, molecules that are not too long etcetera. Okay, so, it is also called as the bulk viscosity is uh, taken as 0. Okay, so, uh, we will now uh, use the, this uh, relationship to go back to dij and write the um, constants uh, mu 1 and mu 2 as just one constant mu and that we are writing here. So, we instead of uh, mu 1 we write minus 2 by 3 mu 2 and instead of mu 2 we just say mu. Okay, so, minus 2 by 3 mu delta ij delta plus this. Okay, so, we write this expression we now see that this expression okay, so is coming quite neat. Okay. So, now you see that on the right hand side you have got only the uh, symmetric part of the uh, strain rate tensor and we have got the uh, rate of dilation and just one quantity viscosity mu. So, now we see that this mu the symbol is chosen very you know uh, carefully this mu is nothing but viscosity okay. and uh, the property tensor A is the most general way of writing it, but with all these manipulations we come to the conclusion that it is nothing but the viscosity itself we are talking about. Okay. Now, let us take that expression and see what happens. Okay. This expression when you take for i and j becoming 1 and 2, so i is equal to 1 and j is equal to 2 then d 1 2, d 1 2 is nothing but tau x y. Okay. So, we see that this expression okay, for 1 d turns out as tau x y is equal to mu dou v by dou x. Okay. 
Now, this is nothing but the statement of Newton's law for fluids which is basically saying that the fluid we are talking about is a Newtonian fluid. So, in other words when we started off saying that d i j is equal to a i j k l dou u k by dou x l, this is actually saying that it is nothing but most general form of the Newton's law of viscosity here. And uh, And when we apply it for 1D, we see the expression which is very popular in the textbooks and uh, this is what actually we normally use. So, we can see that the tensorial part is actually the starting point and this can be obtained from it straight away using the manipulations that we have done till now. Okay. Now, uh, we have the um, dij expressed in terms of the velocity gradients. So, let us just go ahead and put it in the uh, equation of motion. So, we saw that uh, this entire thing is basically sigma and sigma is written as two components the pressure component and uh, dij okay so the pressure component minus p okay and then it is also written as dij and then we saw that this is coming straight here in and this is coming via the linear constitutive equation as quantity. So, we can see that the expression that is written in the equation of motion is used as it is except that we have expanded sigma on the right hand side. Now, what we do is term by term we can apply this particular operator and see what happens. Now, here is where the property of uh, uh, delta Kronecker delta to swap the indices will be useful. So, you could see that uh, when you when you have delta i j and x j then these indices are same. So, the i will be then uh, uh, coming out. So, you could see that this will give me this term. Okay, So, I have only i index that comes straight away from the subscript notation uh, convention that we have used. So, if you are not convinced you can actually expand and see what happens and you will come to the same conclusion. Okay. Now, uh, the second term, okay, the second term you then expand uh, e i j. Okay. So, we already know that e i j is nothing but half of dou u i by dou x j plus dou u j by dou x i. Okay. So, this is what you are going to substitute in and then you see that 2 and this half will cancel and we got the rest of the expressions. Okay. So, this is coming because you have got this first term. So, the first term is coming here and then the second term is coming here. Okay. So, you could see that the 2 and this half is getting cancelled, the mu is sitting there. Okay, undisturbed and this is the term. The last term is kept as it is. Okay. So, the 2 is going in. So, minus 2 by 3 mu delta into okay, the Kronecker delta and then the delta i j and j I am just making this dou x i. So, the subscript notation usage is very much there here for us to make the simplification. So, what we have written now here in the bottom is basically equation of motion for a generally any fluid whether it is uh, compressible or incompressible because we are just leaving it as it is here. Okay. So, at this moment what we do is that we do further manipulations of the expression. So, all the terms are kept as it is and then we inspect a term by term what happens. So, what happens is that here okay, you could see that the equation here you have got the indices the same here and they are not the same here. So, what we do is that can we swap these two indices okay, because uh, you can see that the order of differentiation should not matter if the quantity u is uh, uh, well behaved function uh, and mu is not location dependent. So, then you can swap those. So, we, we do that and when we do that you see that here we get delta coming in. Okay. So, when we swap the indices the first term is left as it is. Okay. So, then when you take this term and the second term then you can see that here it is uh, uh, mu into delta and here it is minus 2 by 3 mu into delta. So, it must be 1 by 3 mu into delta. So, these two together are giving this term. Okay. So, that is about it. Okay. There is remaining terms on the left hand side and the first three terms are untouched. Okay. So, now you have got this equation which basically is uh, the typical form that you would see in textbooks uh, which we also call as Navier-Stokes equation uh, for any fluid which uh, can be either uh, incompressible or compressible. So, very often one would 
wonder where is this 1 by 3 coming and so we now have an origin for that. The 1 by 3 is coming because of the Stokes assumption and the stress of the delta being 3 etcetera. So, that is how this term is coming and this statement is nothing but the Newton's second law applied to control volume. So, this equation is what is worth remembering. Okay. So, this is referred to as the NS equation. And if you want to now look at the Navier Stokes equation for a limited uh, situations like a incompressible fluid, then we can actually knock off one of the terms. You can see the last term has the delta there, we know that for an incompressible fluid the delta is 0. So, we can just knock it off and then write the Navier Stokes equation for incompressible fluids by knocking off the last term. Okay. Now, when we are knocking off the last term, we see that uh, there is this uh, uh, term which we want to expand and then we want to expand it by showing. Uh, Okay, that uh, you could write it as dou square by dou x square. Okay, so so here is basically the Navier-Stokes equation for incompressible fluid. Okay, and uh, this uh, operator, okay, dou square by dou x j square is nothing but the Laplacian operator. So you could actually write that also, and uh, this operator is nothing but the gradient operator. Okay. So, you could actually now write the Navier-Stokes equation for an incompressible fluid using the vectorial operators as well. Okay. That is what we do here. Okay. So, we use the vectorial operators and we have the gradient here, we have the uh, see the left hand side has a d by dt the material derivative, we are expanding the material derivative on the left hand side and on the right hand side we have got the gradient operators and Laplacian operators that we use. So, you could see that this now becomes the uh, in vectorial notation the Navier-Stokes equation for incompressible fluid. We are defining a quantity called the kinematic viscosity. So, if mu is called the dynamic viscosity, then uh, nu becomes the kinematic viscosity and the units of uh, uh, nu happens to be meter square per second and that will be the same unit units as the diffusivity which means that you could think of a nu as momentum diffusivity. Okay, so, nu can be thought of as momentum diffusivity, so you can then plug that in and therefore, this is also one of the popular ways by which the uh, Navier-Stokes equations are appearing um, for an incompressible fluid. Okay. And you also notice that the del square operator also implies that there is no location dependency of the viscosity which also means that for constant viscosity constant properties. So, we can also say for constant properties. Okay. So, this is how the derivation of the Navier-Stokes equation has come about. Okay. So, I hope you now are clear how this uh, equation came about starting from the Newton's second law all the way through all the manipulations with respect to the control volume, with respect to the usage of the tensor properties, the Neumann principle, the material derivative and so on. So, you can see that this is the culmination of all the things that we have been discussing for the last 4 or 5 sessions and it is a very good idea to brush up all those concepts before we go through this particular derivation. What we now do is we use this equation as a starting point for all the problem solutions from now on. That is because we can avoid having to do the momentum balance for every problem. It does not make sense because once you have done momentum balance as a part of the Navier-Stokes equation, then you are done with it and you can just simply use that equation as it is and then knock off terms that you do not need and then solve the problems. So, we are going to do that in the following sessions. So, you can check the website for the practice assignments and uh, practice the derivation by changing some of the terms in between to make sure that you have understood the derivation.